Okay, you're going first. Do you want to be in the aisle? Yeah. Here. Uh, Go ahead.
So, diversity. So diversity is a lot of different things. We can talk about race, we can talk about gender identity, sexual orientation, ethnicity, religion, immigration status, socioeconomic class. It's a lot of things you might not even think of. Ability, disability, age, height, and weight when we're conducting science. Uh, your interests, your education, your language. Diversity is a really broad thing. So I want you guys to keep this in mind when we're talking about diversity, because we're not just talking about race or gender or the simple stuff. There's a lot of different ways we can be diverse. In our talk, we want to address two different ideas about diversity. The first idea we want to talk about is scientists and how diverse we are as scientists. And secondly, how we as scientists need to think about diversity when we're doing our work. So for my little introduction, what I'm going to talk about is four things. So I'm going to start with why do we need diversity in science? Um, and what can happen when there's a lack of diversity among scientists. Uh, then Kate is going to talk about what does a scientist look like, and I'm going to come back to say what can we do to promote diversity in science. So we're going to start with why do we need diversity in science? Well, we need diversity because we need the best scientists tackling our problems. And first I'm going to tell you how diversity helps us all think better, so we can all, not even if we're just scientists, use diversity to work out our problems better. I'm going to talk about how diverse scientists specifically do better science. I'm going to talk about funding as a big barrier to promoting diversity. And I'm going to end with um, why how we as scientists think about diversity in our work matters to everyone. So Obama said that we're not going to succeed if we've got half the team on the bench, especially when it's the smarter half of the team. Our diversity is a strength, and we've got to leverage all of our talent in order to make ourselves as creative and solve as many problems as we can be. And Obama said this at the White House Science Fair, when he was actively working to promote diversity in science and science among young people. And this is basically the whole answer to our question, is we need all of our scientists on the field. But what does the research really say about why we need diversity? Because sometimes it feels like a good statement is not really backed up. But actually, the science backs up that diversity is really helpful. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some, a research study that was done. And this research study was look, looking at in-groups, or the people that are like us, have a lot of interests in common with us, and have the same ideas as us. So think of you and your friends. So this is our in-group. A lot in common with them, we have the same ideas, we look alike. But what happens when you bring in a new power? So this study was actually done with different sororities. So they've got one sorority, this is the purple in-group, and they put them in little groups of three, and to each group of three, they add a new person. And the new person is either in the in-group, so in the same sorority, or it's from an out-group. So an out-group would be someone who you don't share a lot of common with, who looks different from you, has different values from you, is a very different from you, or a diverse person. In this case, someone from another sorority. And the question is, when you're working together as a group, do you want someone who's a lot like you, or do you want someone who's a lot different than you? We're asking how hard will the group work? Will they consider each other's thoughts when they work together? And will the group get the answer correct? Because in this case, the group was trying to solve a murder mystery together. So the first thing that you might have suspected from your work is that when you bring in an out newcomer or you bring in someone who's very different from you, it really does not feel as good. So this is measuring social validation. So this is how good I feel about my group and if I feel happy about the work I'm doing. And you can see from our scale to happy to kind of met that when you bring in the in-group newcomer, you already know who has so much in common with you. You feel great about it, but if you're working with an out-group newcomer, you're a little more empty about it. But actually, this, the, what comes up for attention is very different. So if you bring in your new group, in group newcomer, and you measure how much attention you're paying to what they say. If they agree with you, you pay a lot of attention to them because you feel validated. If they don't agree with you, you kind of ignore what they're saying. So that's okay. That might not be so great if they have really interesting things to say. But what gets more interesting is when you compare it to an out group newcomer. So an out group newcomer who agrees with you, you actually pay even more attention to them. Okay, you're getting validated, even though they're diverse. But when they don't agree with you, you pay a massive amount of attention to them compared to someone who doesn't agree with you. So why is this important? Well, if they have a really great idea that's different than anything you've heard before, you're going to listen to someone who's different from you more than someone who's the same as you. So what does 
So why does this matter? When you're paying more attention, you're thinking harder as a group, and you're actually more likely to get the answer right. So as I said, these groups were trying to solve a murder mystery. So the question is, did they get it right? So the way they did the study is, remember I said they have three people who are an in-group, they're from the same sorority, and they bring in a newcomer, and the newcomer is either in the same in-group or they're a newcomer from an out-group. And the way that investigators did this is a little sneaky. So they put on the murder mystery, then they asked everyone their opinions, and then they put them in the group. So they go into these groups knowing if the people already had the right idea about the murderer or were on the wrong track. And they can say, did the group end up coming to the right consensus? So what I'm comparing in these is an in-group and an out-group, and the X's mean that they don't know the right answer. So first of all, when the entire group comes in not knowing the right answer, in the in-group, they completely get it incorrect. But actually, in the out-group, then 33% of the time, they get it correct. So here in red, in the pie graphs, I'm showing correct and incorrect. So that's interesting. When no one knows the answer, they all, I guess, talk a little more, think a little harder in the out-group, and some of them come up with the right answer. When you have the newcomer who actually knows the right answer, remember I told you that they're paying more attention to a newcomer was a diverse idea? You can see that here. And in the end group, they're more likely to be ignoring the newcomer, and they just don't get the answer right. Whereas in the out group, over 50% of the time, they end up with the correct answer, with only that one newcomer knowing what the answer was. And when you have two and two, almost every single out group gets the correct answer, versus the in group that's 50-50. So it's really easy to see that the groups are working a lot harder when they've got a diverse person. But the second thing is, there's this great idea you've probably heard, is that we should just get to the heart of everyone, and we want to find what we have in common with our peers, and that's how we can overcome diversity. But that's not actually what the research says about how diversity works. So if I have a scenario, I have a ghost, and I have a robot. And they look really different on the surface. They're different mythological species, so I would say that they have surface level differences. But after talking for a while, they realize they both really love cats. So they've got this deep similarity. And our common wisdom would say that, oh, and now that they found out they love cats, they're just going to be best friends, they're going to work much harder, better together. It's going to be fantastic. So we should solve diversity by finding out how we're all the same. But this is not actually what the research says. Because while we know that similar groups don't work hard, because I showed you that in the previous study, and we know that surface level diverse groups are going to actually get the answer right more and perform better, once you've highlighted those deep level similarities, you actually start to perform worse. So once you figure out that you're all the same, you go back to not paying attention and feeling really good about each other and not working hard to find the right answer. So diversity is really, really good, and what you want at all times is someone working with you who's completely different from you to help push you to think harder. But why is the diversity of scientists important? So we're all scientists, and what research has found is, just like this study, when you have a lot of diverse scientists together, so scientists who have different ethnicities and nationalities, they actually produce stronger science that has a greater impact on the field. And I want to highlight one big barrier to diverse scientists, and Kate and Jacob are going to talk a lot more about this later, but one interesting one that might not be common knowledge. So the federal government funds science, just so you know, but it hasn't been in the game of funding science that heavily for that long. It's been about 75 years since the end of the Second World War. And when we got into the game was around 1945, and this is a quote by Vannevar Bush, who was a really famous science advisor, in the World War, and he thought that we should fund the best science. And he said, if ability and not the circumstances of family fortune determines who shall receive higher education in science, then we shall be assured of constantly improving quality at every level of scientific activity. So what he's saying is, we should fund the best scientists. We should find who they are. We shouldn't pick the rich ones. We should fund the best ones, and then we're going to do the best science. But there's really a bias in this system. So to go over how funding works. So something like the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, is a government agency that funds science. So they're going to ask scientists, hey, submit a proposal on this topic. Scientists then need to submit their great ideas. Those great ideas are graded by other scientists. So other scientists take the time to read them, say how good they are. 
Then proposals that get a certain grade get funded. Fantastic, right? It's a meritocracy. We're funding the best science. They're even supposed to include diversity. So they're supposed to be graded on scientific merit, and they're supposed to consider the diversity of the institution and make that a priority. But there's still a lot of bias in the system. So first of all, the NIH is only going to ask for a popular topic. So what if we have a really wacky idea that is going to change the world and just doesn't have to be popular right now? It must have important applications. So who determines what's important? If I only see my world, maybe what's important to me is very different than what's important to my neighbor. Then proposals take a lot of effort. So you might think that these proposals are just, this is what I want to do with science, but actually they're like massively long documents with lots and lots of effort. So you kind of need a lot of time and willpower to write this proposal a bit. A young scientist who's just starting out may not have that kind of time. The other thing is, a proposal is sometimes more of a, I already did this science, give me the money, than really, this is the science I want to do. So in some cases, you already need the money to write the proposal. That again, a young, diverse scientist just starting out may not have money. Um, and then they're graded by other scientists. And everyone wants to think that they're unbiased, and they're looking at an academic work, and they're not caring about who writes it. But Gotta say, everyone has implicit bias, and at some level, reviewers are gonna be biased. And then these reviewers, if they think the science is just too out there, they might say it's too novel and not want to fund it. So there's really issues with funding, and when we look at who gets money from the federal government, this is definitely borne out. So what I'm showing you is the probability of receiving funding. So probability is, you know, between 30 and 40 percent of each proposal submitted gets funded. And this is different American communities. And you can see that Asian and black communities are funded far less than white and Hispanic communities. And this gets even starker when I show you that this is the average of all proposals. So actually, it's the white researchers who are way overrepresented, and the Asian and black researchers who are underrepresented who get something. So this is just one of the many barriers to diverse scientists getting involved in science. So I want to end with why should why should all scientists think about diversity it matter to everyone? Because I told you about why diversity helps us think better, and I told you about why diverse scientists are doing why diverse scientists do better science. But if you're not a scientist, it may not matter to you that much that like we as scientists are diverse. But it actually does. Because when we as scientists don't think about diversity, we don't consider everyone's needs. And the world likes to ask big things of scientists to help us solve really big problems. And we as scientists need to be thinking about our world diversely so we can answer those problems in ways that everyone benefits. So for example, combating global warming and emerging scientific challenges and making better pharmaceuticals. So when you think about scientific justice, it's about using science to do good things for everyone and consider everyone's needs. So what, there's a lot of issues with global warming and environmental issues that really require scientific justice. So for example, toxic waste sites. These are, because of, you know, not in my backyard, these are often in minority and poor communities. When we think about climate regulations, we need to think about the different needs of developing and developed countries, where it's much easier for us to switch to solar power because we have the money to buy solar panels, it's much harder sometimes for developing countries to make that switch in the same way. And when we think about global warming and sea level rise, these issues are overwhelmingly going to affect poor and minority communities. So we as scientists, when we're working on these issues, we really need to think about diversity and think about people who are not our people so we can answer these questions in a way that everyone benefits. The second example I'm going to give you is designing better pharmaceuticals. So there's a lot of diseases that don't affect us here in the United States. So there's this big issue with neglected tropical diseases. So these are diseases that affect millions and billions of people in the developing world, but we just don't see them in the United States. So a lot of our best researchers are not working on that. The other big issue with designing pharmaceuticals is making sure that medical research does research on everyone. Because many clinical trials, when they're trying to uh, build a new drug, they often use only white and male participants. And that's an issue because it's a missing really important disparities in how people respond to medications. So for example, this is the percentage of people with asthma of different ethnicities in the United States. So it's Puerto Rican Americans, Black Americans, White Americans, and Mexican Americans. 
So you can see that Puerto Rican Americans have almost twice the incidence of asthma as white Americans. So you think we should be doing our research on them as well. Um, in one really bad example, one of the drugs developed for asthma just doesn't work in black Americans because we missed key genetic differences that would have allowed it to work. So it's really important that the clinical trial design uses diverse participants and is actually looking at the populations that have diseases. So I'm going to stop for a break for questions and then I'm going to hand it over to Kate. Jacob. Several microphones that switch over. If you have any questions, still have time. <laughs> Thanks for bearing with us, guys. <laughs> Is there a question? Yeah, just a quick question. Um, yeah. You said that when you have a diverse group of scientists, you're going to generally produce stronger data and stronger results. How do you qualify those results? How do you know if they're actually strong? Um, so, science measures. Could you repeat the question, please? Sorry. So the question was how we tell when there's diverse scientists that they're actually producing better results. So one of the ways that science measures the impact of our results is a metric called the impact factor. And it takes into account the strength of the journal where the science was published and the number of times other research articles cited that journal. So it's a metric that the journals actually compute. Um, and the research used that impact factor for the different articles to kind of mathematically figure out which one had a higher impact factor overall. Yes? How do you know that those metrics aren't also biased? Because uh, thinking about the impact factor in particular and how um, especially people of color like tend to have roles as like being advisors for other underrepresented students and tend to be more involved in like helping their communities than like white scientists per se. Um, and therefore are dedicating less time to their science because of those pressures that white scientists don't have to work on. So you already have an inherent bias there that doesn't take that into account. Yes, the question is whether the impact factor metric is valid because different scientists may not spend as much time publishing because they're doing other things for their community. And I would totally agree with you that it probably is. Um, you know, this research study I think was trying to use the best metric available, but that totally is a phenomenon that I know women, it's a big example too, and diverse scientists that are spending more of their time on other responsibilities than just publishing. So really we do need some better metrics to figure out, you know, to reward people for their work and figure out who's the best scientist. Right. So, Maddie just told you about some ways in which the structure of science funding erects barriers to younger, more diverse voices in science. The kind of voices which may be more intentional about equally serving non male, non white general, general public. Whether that means research into climate adaptation, women's health, or tropical disease. But there are other ways in which the courts of the scientific bureaucracy affect science in bad ways. I'm going to give you a particularly dramatic example. It's a story about how a math mistake from 100 years ago was used as a scientific justification for racism. This simple math mistake should have been easily and quickly corrected. But senior scientists with power over scientific journals ended up delaying the publication of this correction by 16 years. And by that time, scientific racism had already seeped into the public consciousness. In fact, it still is. Our story begins in Cambridge, Massachusetts about a month ago. The date is September 7, 2017. Amid protests, Charles Murray is coming to Harvard campus to give a talk. Who is Charles Murray? Well, the Southern Poverty Law Center labels him a white nationalist, writing, quote, Charles Murray has become one of the most influential social scientists in America, using racist pseudoscience and misleading statistics to argue that social inequality is caused by the genetic inferiority of the black and Latino communities, women and the poor. 
So why was he invited to campus? Well, the undergraduate president of the Harvard Open Campus Initiative, which is the student group that invited him, said that his group, quote, only invites people whom we believe have something to add to the academic and intellectual discourse on this campus. Fair enough. But for all that has been said about free speech on college uh, campuses and intellectual freedom, and I'm sure you've seen plenty, I'm going to stick to the science. And this is the story I'm going to tell. I'm going to tell you how the so-called science that Charles Murray uses to justify his views is actually built on a shaky foundation. Now, you might be skeptical, with good reason. If his science is really that obviously wrong, why are we still talking about it? Why is he still being invited to speak on college campuses all across America? I'm going to tell you about how the structure of science and scientific publishing played a key role in allowing the pseudoscience to persist. So Charles Murray has a PhD in political science from MIT. He's most known for writing The Bell Curve, together with Richard Hermstein, a professor of psychology at Harvard. Published in 1994, it was immediately controversial and instantly a bestseller. Because the book would drive an academic, people took it seriously. It was extensively talked about in the public press. But the somber, reserved academic tone and tables of data belied how extreme its views were. The book argued that everyone was born with a fixed level of intelligence, and that everything from financial success to job performance and even criminality was largely determined by this intelligence, as measured by IQ tests. The title of the bell curve refers to the shape of the distribution of intelligence among people. And they argue that the people on the far right of this distribution, those with unusually high intelligence, would eventually become the new upper class in America. Because they asserted that intelligence was at least a significant part of genetic, they implicitly made the argument that people who lead more successful lives are doing so in part because they have superior genes, which was a controversial argument to say the least. But much of the subsequent debate focused on two chapters where Murray and Bernstein argued that black Americans were less intelligent than white Americans. But they weren't the first to say so. In making that argument, they largely cited the research of Arthur Jensen, a distinguished uh, professor of psychology at the University of California, Berkeley, who was a major figure in 20th century psychology, although now known primarily for his controversial research on intelligence difference between racial groups. Now, this may sound blatantly racial, racist to you, I hope it does, but keep in mind, he managed to publish all this research in mainstream psychology journals because it quotes tables and tables of seemingly objective scientific data. In a 1985 paper, he writes about systematic differences in IQ scores between white and black Americans. And he's not actually wrong about that. On the SAT, the GRE, any IQ test you come with, on average, it's important, on average, black Americans do score lower than white Americans. It's an unfortunate truth that persists even today. So stating that black Americans score less than white Americans on a certain test, that's still within the bounds of science. But where objective reporting of scientific data turns into mere prejudice is when he writes in his 1985 paper that, quote, the average black-white difference on diverse mental tests may be interpreted as chiefly a difference in intelligence. The racism begins when you assume that you can measure someone's entire cognitive ability, indeed their worth to society, with a single test score. And that's what he's arguing here. Now, we live in an age where we're all familiar with standardized testing and IQ tests. So we take it for granted that a person's intelligence can be one, measured, and two, captured by a single number. But the idea that intelligence is a single thing that you can have more of or less of, it can be measured by a single test, these things are not obvious. In fact, there was a time when we didn't think about intelligence that way. Someone had to come up with that idea. And that person was Charles Spear. In 1904, a psychologist named Charles Spearman published a paper, General Intelligence, Objectively Measured and Determined. He finds that there's a quantity, which he calls the general intelligence, which is essentially what we now call the IQ score. And he comes up with a statistical analysis that shows two things. One, that this general intelligence can be measured objectively using test scores. And two, that a person's entire repertoire of skills and cognitive abilities can be summarized by this one number. Let me show you how this works. Here's some IQ test data. We have four different tests. 
And we have data for thousand students, although I'm just showing you the first grade. And the test is written so that 100 <coughs> is in the average score. And what Spearman hypothesized is that you could take each test score and break it down into two parts. Part that's due to general intelligence, which again is what we now call the IQ score. And a second part, which you call the specific ability. So let's say you get a high score on one test. Maybe you got a high score on a test because you get high scores on every kind of test. That is to say you have a high general intelligence or a high IQ. Or maybe your scores on your other tests aren't so high. So you get a high score on that particular test because you have a particular skill, to say, visual reasoning. So the left-hand side of this equation, that's something we can measure, we can just give someone a test. But how do we know how it breaks down into these two components, general intelligence and specific ability? Now, if you've ever fit a line to a bunch of data in Excel, which I'm sure all of you have at some point in your life, you can actually use exactly the same kind of math to figure out exactly how the test score breaks down into these two components. It's not magic. So let's say we live in a world where some people were just better at everything, and some people were just Worse than everything. What would that look like in this data? So it looks something like this. This is what it would look like if general intelligence predicted test scores with 100% accuracy. Now, of course, we're not going to apply that. Nothing predicts anything else with 100% accuracy. So I'm going to go back to the real test data and I'm going to run the numbers and I'm going to show you what it looks like. And so when we run the map, we see that general intelligence predicts test scores with 40% accuracy. 40% may not sound like a lot. But it was actually enough for Spearman to conclude that he had decisively proven his idea. But I like you. These numbers I've shown you, as you might have guessed, they're not real test scores. They're actually random numbers that mimic the statistical properties of real test scores. And because they're random numbers, you shouldn't expect to find anything that looks like the general intelligence. The general intelligence shouldn't predict anything. And yet it does. Spearman's statistical analysis Seems to find it does. Forty percent. So I wrote a piece of code that generates these random numbers. It conducts experiments analysis, and you can run it a bunch of times. And like sometimes you get thirty percent, sometimes you get fifty percent. It's always around there. You'll always see that Spearman's general intelligence hypothesis seems to be supported by the data, even though the data are not real test scores. They're random numbers. So we are led to conclude that the whole idea of the intelligence quotient. The IQ score, that you can measure someone's intelligence objectively and summarize it with a single number, was on shaky foundations from the beginning. It's just an artifact of how Spearman analyzed this data. So, why do we still talk about IQ scores? This was over 100 years ago. Why didn't anyone notice this problem? But someone did. In 1986, Peter, uh, while reviewing Arthur Jensen's 1985 paper on <coughs> intelligence differences, a psychologist, Peter Schoenemann, discovered the same flaw in Spearman's analysis I just showed you. He used a computer program to generate random numbers just like I did. But he went further. He actually proved a mathematical theorem showing that something that looks a lot like an IQ score will pop out of any table of random data, so long as the random numbers mimic certain statistical properties of real test scores. So why do we still think the validity of IQ scores for granted? Why were Jensen and Murray and Bernstein able to use IQ scores to the racist ends, even if we should have known better, starting back in 1986? Well, because Schoenemann tried for 16 years to get his critique published. So when you publish something in science, you submit your paper to a scientific journal. The editor of the journal reads it. And if they think it's worth taking a look at, they send it to a few other established scientists to read and rate in a process called peer review. The paper only gets published if all of these scientists and the journal editor agree that the paper is worthy of publication. <laughs> what happened in Schoenemann's case is the psychologists who studied intelligence, they didn't really understand the math, so they didn't appreciate the strength of Schoenemann's arguments, and they rejected the paper on those grounds. They didn't feel it was compelling enough to upturn the consensus among psychologists, which at the time was that there are intelligence differences between racial groups. But Schoenemann also submitted his paper to statistics journals, and the statisticians knew the math was right. There was never any argument about that. But they said, hey, we're talking about race and intelligence. This isn't really our real house. We're not going to publish this. And throughout all of this, there was a sense of, everyone knows that there are racial differences in intelligence. This is the orthodoxy. 
How dare you question it? And so no one was necessarily acting in bad faith, but even so, the net effect was that it took 16 years for Schoenemann's critique to be published. General Rice, uh, Schoenemann published an account of this ordeal uh, titled Better Never Than Light, Peer Review and the Preservation of Prejudice. He writes, quote, on some issues of transparent and far-reaching social relevance, it has become virtually impossible to correct published errors in mainstream scientific journals as long as the official gatekeepers, for whatever reason, deem such corrections inopportune. Bob Herbert, in a New York Times columnist writing just after the publication of the bell curve, wrote principally, scholars are already marshalling the evidence needed to demolish the bell curve on scientific grounds, but be assured that when their labors are completed and their papers submitted, they will not get nearly the attention that the bell curve has received. And he was right. Indeed, Schoenemann's paper was finally published in 2002, published in an obscure journal, and isn't even available online. If you want to read it, you probably can't find it. And so that's the story. Charles Spearman made an innocent math mistake back in 1904. Arthur Jensen applied this flawed theory of IQ to make a scientific sounding claim that black Americans were less intelligent than white Americans. Charles Murray and Richard Hernstein took Jensen's ideas and ran with them, finding that they concorded well with their political beliefs. They ended up writing a book arguing that people's success in society depended largely on their innate intelligence, concluding that government shouldn't waste resources educating the uneducable. If they didn't have PhDs from places like Harvard and MIT, if they didn't have faculty positions at Berkeley and Harvard, they were writing blog posts instead of dry academic papers. We would call them mere racists. They wouldn't be invited to speak at Harvard University nor anywhere else. But by cloaking themselves in the veil of dispassionate, rigorous science, they were able to speak to the general public with the authority of scientific objectivity. Now, you might say, why isn't this in some sense a success story? Because science eventually self corrected. That's the scientific method at work. The vast majority of psychologists now agree that there's no scientific evidence for racial differences in intelligence. But science has a privileged place in society. It is considered an unbiased, objective source of facts. And when science makes a pronouncement, it is often amplified by the popular press. Once an idea is out there and labeled as science, it sticks around and it shapes how we, as a society, talk about issues and how we design public policy. I hope I've shown you why the idea of IQ is at the very least questionable. But this way of thinking about intelligence built upon spearman shoddy foundations, it's pervasive. From a young age, we implicitly teach our children that some kids are just smarter than other kids, that some kids are just not very good at math, and that no amount of studying or hard work can really change that. I mean, how often have you been told that you have good genes because everyone in your family is very successful in their career? It happens all the time. Even though their validity has been brought into question, IQ scores are still used to select children for gifted educational programs, and to decide if Ellen's are eligible for the death penalty. And on the fringes, there are those who argue that you should need a minimum IQ to vote or to immigrate to the United States. And actually, these aren't quite as fringe as you might think. That last one, that you should need a minimum IQ to immigrate to the United States, that was a 2009 PhD, PhD dissertation at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Once bias science gets out there, it's really hard to get away from it. But looking at this timeline, it's hard not to hope that maybe all of this could have been avoided. If Schoenemann's critique had been published sooner, that might have nipped it in the bud. Maybe. I don't know. If the UC Berkeley psychology department had a more diverse faculty and had graduate students from more diverse cultural and educational backgrounds, maybe Jensen could have heard compelling critiques, gotten more perspective on this research before he put any of it into print. We can help. And I want to be clear, I'm not just talking about racial and gender diversity, although those are hugely important. I'm talking about all kinds of diversity. Certainly, Schoenemann's critique might have had a friendlier reception if more psychologists had college degrees in math. So educational background is totally part of diversity, too. But I think it's fair to say that the racial, gender, and socioeconomic homogeneity of science renders it especially susceptible to making the kinds of mistakes I've highlighted here today. My point is, look, scientists are people. 
Any single scientist can make a mistake. They can reject a good paper or deny a worthy scientist a job or a promotion. We scientists, we all have our blind spots. We're stubborn. We don't like to be told that we're wrong. And how we think about the world is colored by our own life experiences, just as much as anyone else. So that's really why diversity in science is so important. If you're in science, you're in the business of generating and evaluating ideas. And the more perspectives you have, the better you're going to be able to do that. Diversity in science is not just a moral imperative, it's a scientific imperative. It's that simple. It's simple, but it's not easy. Because senior scientists who determine who gets funded, who gets published, and who gets a job in science, the gatekeepers of science, they represent a startling lack of diversity. And so how things stand, it's really hard for new diverse voices to enter into the scientific community. Now, Kate is going to tell you more about that, the state of diversity in science, and hopefully leave you feeling at least a little hopeful about where things are headed. But first, let's take a little break, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yes, go ahead. Um, how exactly did uh, Spearman originally calculate G from all of those individual tests? Uh, so the question was, how did Spearman calculate G, uh, which is the um, sort of technical name for what became the IQ score uh, from the data of the individual tests? So Spearman, and this is a technical aside, uh, originally used factor analysis, later analysis, uh, or later work also used principal component analysis. And so there's sort of parallel literatures. And it turns out the same things you can prove for factor analysis, you can prove for uh, PCA. And you can also extend all of these results into what is now what people use, which is sort of a hierarchical factor analysis, where you don't just have all your tests and then IQ, but you have all your tests and then sort of a middle layer of coarser grade intelligences that all then lead to G or IQ. Any other questions? Is there an intermission here? Yes. Can I just make an announcement too that we have an activity that we're kind of going to kind of talk about um, at the end of the lecture. So if you want to come up, we have some worksheets and markers, and you can just follow the directions on the worksheets with the markers, and then we'll kind of debrief um, at the end. But now would be a good time to do that because we're going to talk about some of the results from similar types of activities um, in my section. <laughs> And that study was due to a common genetic variant that black Americans I was like, I was photographing it. Well, there is ethnic diversity. Yeah. Today with the internet. The, uh, 
That's interesting. The, uh, yes. So you have a handout, and if you want, you have a drawing activity. So you're this, so this is an activity if you want to draw a scientist. You don't have to. I can take a pen back there. You can take a picture. Oh, I'm going to. It's always not made the sci-fi plane, also. I'm going to leave it, I guess, with a completely different venue, but. Yes, I don't know. I wonder what happened. I feel like it's just harder and harder to get people to do stuff on the internet. Yeah. I like the, I like the slides. Yeah. Can you hear? Yeah, oh yeah. This thing, this thing magnifies things. Well, I can even hear it from your hearing. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, it, uh, uh, it's a very interesting topic. Uh, well, I would think in this day and age, a proposal. All things being equal, a proposal with non diverse presenters and diverse presenters. It was pretty close in, in the importance of the uh, relevance. Uh, do you think diversity could have an effect on the, on the outcome? Like, how well science can stop? Yeah, so, yeah but if you have two proposals, you have money that everybody's shooting for. So he's you know, putting in a report, oh, yeah. like, you know, foundation, whatever it is. I think it was and, uh, and there's two groups, there's two groups. Oh, okay. And we just happen to be the finalists, and they're very close. Oh. Do, do you think that a diverse... Uh, I mean, I think if they're going to do the science equally, I'm going to do the That's interesting. <laughs> that's really fun. <laughs> Well, she enjoys begging. Why does she make cookies? Oh, okay. Yeah. She's like slow and moving. She's the one on my lap. She's got like, yeah, I can just go back. She's got the whole stand there. Yeah. I don't know, it's really bad. I don't know, it's really bad. I don't know, it's really bad.
draw on what you think a, sci a scientist looks like, and then we'll be able to go from there um, and talk a little bit about that, both in this section and then at the very end of the lecture as well. So I want to pick up with two threads that Jacob kind of left us with. One was this idea that science kind of holds this high place in our minds in society that it must be true. Science is absolutely equated to the absolute truth always, and that it's not this evolving process that we as scientists know it to be. And second, that the popular media can pick up on a science story um, and really blow it up and take uh, one scientific publication or one scientist or even one person writing about science and the popular media can pick it up and really take it um, into a, a worldwide conversation about that particular issue. And I want to share a couple of examples of this that's happened really recently and none, I think, more appropriate than uh, the Google Ideological Echo Chamber Memo that was published by an ex-Google employee named James Moore over the summer, this summer in 2017. And in this uh, controversial memo that circulated within Google and then picked up, was picked up by the popular press, um, he said, the distribution of preferences and abilities of men and women differ in part due to biological causes. Women, on average, have more openness directed towards feelings and aesthetics rather than ideas and more neuroticism. So for me, I looked at this and thought, OK, so he's using bad science, biased science, to justify why there aren't many women software engineers employed at Google. I don't want to work at Google in an environment that doesn't think that I, as a woman, can be a good software engineer. So this is just one example of uh, prejudice in the scientific uh, world that could lead someone to think, mm, maybe this isn't for me. So this was one example that happened really recently, but this happens all the time. Another story from two years ago. Uh, when Nobel laureate Dr. Tim Hunt in a press conference in 2015 said, women in laboratories fall in love with you, and if you criticize them, they cry. It's true that people, I have fallen in love with people in my lab, and people in my lab have fallen in love with me, and it's very disruptive to the science. And after this controversial statement that, again, makes me as a woman not feel very welcome in the scientific community, it was heartening to see a uh, widespread response on Twitter and other social media platforms with hashtags like distractingly sexy with pictures of women in science uh, wearing hazmat suits or doing field work or doing their science um, circulating the web. But this um, prejudice and, uh, in science and the scientific community doesn't just exist for women, it exists for every minority group that you can imagine. I want to share this story. Um, from a study conducted in 2003. Um, it's about the difference between Greg and Jamal, Emily, and Lakeisha. So in this study, the researchers created four resumes that were identical in every way. The same school, the same GPA at that school, the same research experience, the same publications. The only thing that changed among these four resumes were the names. Some had names that were traditionally African-American names, like Jamal and Lakeisha, and some who were white sounding names, like Greg and Emily. They distributed these resumes across to labs across the country, applying for research positions in the lab. And then they measured the callback rate of which lab, how many labs were interested in interviewing and hiring that person based solely on their resume. And here I'm showing the results from this study, where on the x-axis, is plotted the percent callback rate, that is the number, the percentage of applications that were asked for interviews or hired for the job. And I've grouped the results by callback rate for African American sounding names and callback for white sounding names. And as you can see, the callback rate is significantly lower for African American sounding names, despite the fact that these resumes were identical except for their name. And this kind of illustrates the implicit bias that it persists in the scientific community surrounding uh, diversity on all fronts, not just uh, gender, but also racial. And there are millions of other studies that can support this type of bias across all of the different fronts and axes of diversity that uh, Maddie introduced at the beginning. So where does this leave us? It leaves us with this idea that um, kind of contradicts how we normally think about science. 
science is a meritocracy. Maddie also mentioned this, but this is the idea that science uh, inherently will, uh, the best scientists will rise to the top. The very best scientists will publish in those journals that have really high impacts that everyone reads. And the best scientists are <coughs> more hardworking, detail-oriented, communicative. If a person is all of these things that a good scientist should be, they'll rise to the top. So we think of science as a meritocracy, but it's not really a meritocracy. We can have two individuals who are just as hardworking, just as detail-oriented, communicative, collaborative, patient, courageous, and curious. All of these things that a scientist should be, and one of them will reach the highest ranks and highest echelons of science, and another will not reach notoriety, and their science won't get as much recognition. And this uh, um, uneven playing field is due to some of the things that Matt talked about, like uh, scientific funding, um, but can also be due to various other factors that keep diverse scientists from rising through the ranks of the scientific community. So next I want to show you some data proving uh, that the, diver the diverse scientists are underrepresented in science as a whole. So first I'm going to focus on women. Here I'm plotting on the x-axis degrees in science and engineering, bachelor's, master's, and doctorate, over the past two decades, from 1995, 2004, and 2014. And on the y-axis, I'm plotting the percent of women with this degree. That is, all of all people who have a bachelor's in science or engineering, what percent of them are, percentage of them are women. And as you can see, this percentage hovers somewhere between 15 and 30 percent um, for bachelors, and it's even lower for the doctorate level. Very, uh, showing that women are indeed underrepresented in science and engineering. We can make the same sort of plot with the same sort of data for minorities. We're here on the x-axis, I'm plotting uh, years from 1995 through 2014. And on the y-axis, I'm showing the percent of minorities with a degree in science and engineering. These degrees are doctorate, master's, and bachelor's in darkening shades of gray. And as you can see again, uh, for bachelor's degrees, uh, the percent of, percentage of minorities with this degree hover somewhere between 15 and 20 percent of all people with this degree. Minorities are also underrepresented in science and engineering. If you need one plot to really sum up this point and drive uh, what I'm saying home, I hope this plot does. We're here, I'm showing a pie chart of the breakdown of all people. Uh, with an occupation in science and engineering. So as you can see, nearly 50% of people employed in the science and engineering sectors are white men. Another 18% are white women. And the rest of the chunk of the pie um, represent Asian men, Asian women, black men and black women, Hispanic men and women, and people of other ethnicities. Um, so I hope I've shown you that uh, women and minorities are underrepresented in science and engineering. But you might say, why does this matter? Well, this brings us to the activity that we all asked you to do before the lecture. What does a scientist look like? I'm not going to ask anyone to show us their drawing, and I'm going to put myself on the spot and show you mine. Um, so this is what my drawing might look like. Maybe it looks like some of yours. Um, I often have pictured a scientist as a kind of Albert Einstein looking figure, maybe teaching chemistry at the podium, beakers of bubbling liquids by his side. Uh, and in fact, this is what Dr. Chambers found in his 1983 study when he asked grade school children, so eight, grades one through five, to simply draw a scientist. So this became known as the draw a scientist. Uh, test and he conducted this study because he was really interested in uh, the, the stereotypes about scientists that people develop and children develop from a very young age. So he conducted this draw scientist test on thousands of young school children and created a checklist that looked something like this. When he went through drawing by drawing and calculated the number of what he called indicators of uh, stereotypes and science. So if the drawing depicted a scientist wearing a white lab coat, that was a plus one indicator. 
if he had eyeglasses. That was a plus one indicator. And I want to draw your attention to the fact that some of these indicators um, are male-only scientists or Caucasian scientists, middle-aged scientists. Some of these uh, indicators of lack of diversity when we picture a scientist. So I wanted to show you some of the data. So uh, Dr. Chambers' original checklist only had seven indicators by grade one. Um, so on the x-axis of this graph, I'm plotting grade level from one through five. And on the y-axis, I'm plotting the average number of indicators depicted in children's drawings from that grade level. So children in grade one were already having drawings that on average had almost one indicator. And by grade five, um, the number of indicators included in each drawing was over three on average. So these stereotypes were really seeping into the children from a very young age. And you might say, okay, maybe people, maybe these kids are just drawing pictures of themselves. It would be very natural for them to just draw what they would look like as a scientist. But indeed, that's not the case. So if we took a classroom with 50% of the students, women, and 50% men, and we asked them all to draw a scientist, um, and we looked at all the pictures and looked, uh, graded whether they were female or male scientists depicted, nearly 100% of those scientists would be male. And so even though the classroom is 50% female, only 1% of the drawings that that classroom produced are depicting female scientists. This is also true that stereotypes persist independent of student identity when we look at racial indicators. So on the x-axis of this graph, I'm plotting the racial group of the student doing the drawing. And on the y-axis, I'm depicting the percent of drawings with a Caucasian scientist. So 100% of the white students in this study drew a Caucasian scientist. 98% of Native American students in the study also drew a white scientist. And over 75% of African American students drew a white scientist. So why is this a problem? Why do we care that young children have these ingrained stereotypes from a young age? Does it really matter? And I'm, here, I'm going to argue that in fact does. Stereotype threat is this idea that if I remind you of a st negative stereotype about an aspect of your identity, that you're more likely to create a self-fulfilling prophecy and act in accordance with that stereotype. So let me show you how this works. If we take a group of students and have them take a math test, men and women, here shown in red and blue, will score about the same on that math test. Their gender doesn't indicate how well they do on that math test. And this was uh, many, many students, so this is not a significant difference. But if before they take this math test, we remind the women, female students, that th there's a stereotype out there that women are worse at math than men, and then we have them take a math test, they perform much, much worse. So here I'm showing a stereotype threat case where we reminded the uh, people conducting the experiment reminded students of the stereotype that women are worse at math than men, and then asked these students to take math tests, and the females scored way worse than they did when they were not reminded of the stereotype. So the stereotype threat, I would argue, creates a self-fulfilling prophecy, where we have young children not thinking of themselves ever becoming scientists, thinking of scientists as these stereotypically old, white, male um, scientists, and then they have stereotype threat. They don't believe that they could become a scientist looking the way they do, enter the workforce, and then we have this chicken and egg problem where we don't have um, diverse scientists in the workforce because we're not raising children to believe that they could enter the workforce with their identity. So this, I've painted a pretty bleak picture of this scenario, but you might be asking, well, what can we do to stop this? We want to increase diversity. Maddie and Jacob have showed us that we need increased diversity in science. What can we do? And I have one piece of hopeful news, and that's that some interventions are effective. So here I'm showing results from a study in which 
uh, female scientists from the community were asked to come in and talk to classrooms of fifth through eighth graders about their science. Their teachers connected their science that they were learning in the classroom to work done by female scientists historically. They really emphasized the fact that women could contribute positively to the scientific knowledge of the world. And this happened in the female scientist role model intervention case with a depicting in dark red. And as you can see, there was a generally positive feeling towards women in science after these interventions. Compared to a classroom where these interventions were not happening, where there was no mention of the contributions of women to science. And there's a more mutual and negative opinion towards women in science. So I hope that this shows you that there is some hope that we can intervene at the school child level. Um, and this, these results are near and dear to my heart because I go into the community, as I mentioned before, and enjoy teaching during um, genetics and evolution units in eighth grade classrooms in Cambridge. And I talk about how wonderful it is to be a woman in science. And hopefully I'm having the same effect on those kids as was borne out in this study here. So over the course of the last 15 or so minutes, I hope I've showed you that right now the scientific workforce is not that diverse. And kids see that and know that and uh, adopt these stereotypes of scientists from a very young age. But there is hope that we can intervene in this cycle and hopefully increase diversity over in science over generations. And now I'm going to hand it over to Maddie to give you some more hopeful news to end off our talk. <laughs> After we transfer <laughs> all of the microphones. So, home balloons. So we've talked a lot about lots of different things today. I'm going to kind of bring it a little bit back together. So we have these big challenges, and we're hoping to convince we can convince you that these challenges are important and something we need to work on. But it is getting better. There's a lot of greater recognition that diversity is important. So we three are standing here telling you it's important. It's becoming a bigger national conversation. We're getting a lot more diversity in STEM education and very active efforts to recruit and expand um, inclusion of diverse students. And we're going to increase funding for graduate students and early career investigators who are diverse. And we're bringing back some points that we just talked about, that science is not a meritocracy. That for all these attributes that go into being what we think is a good scientist, some people are just going to end up higher. And another analogy we can say is that for two scientists, who are running the same race towards becoming a great scientist, the diverse one is just going to have a lot more hurdles in their path. The society is putting in front of them. So I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing to both remove those hurdles and give those diverse scientists who've already passed a lot of hurdles a little bit of a leg up at the end so that everyone at the end of the day is on the same playing field. So what works to improve diversity? So we talked about mentorship, that's one thing. One of the biggest things is making diversity visible. So we both teach scientists to young girls. I go every summer for a week and to a sleepaway camp and talk about science. And it's just fantastic to see what, what seeing a scientist who is like you does to a kid. So making diversity visible. Inclusion-focused teaching. So teaching the kids when they're in kindergarten that a scientist can be anyone, not just an old white man. We need diversity-focused recruitment. So when you're trying to get uh, young folks into graduate education, we get clear that we're we want diverse students in graduate education. And moreover, understanding the background that diverse students come from, so we're recruiting the best, and know that not every student's background is going to look the same if they grew up somewhere different. We need inclusive admissions practices that really does understand a holistic student and doesn't just take one variable or a few set of factors, but really understands them as a whole person. Um, we need mentorship during training and early career that we talked about as being really successful, and that needs to continue at the graduate level and even early career scientists, we need mentors who can help them improve. And we need to increase funding to diverse 
researchers and remove some of those roadblocks I talked to you about in the funding framework. And one of the good news is that graduate enrollment is improving. So we're starting to get there where we are going to have a more diverse scientific workforce. So what I'm showing you is 1989 to 2009, and this is enrollment in PhD programs. And I'm showing you from the bottom up Hispanic, Black, Native American, Asian Pacific Islander, and other, which is multiracial or other ethnic group, American grad students. And you can see we're improving pretty well from 1989 to 2009. And this is this percent of the total population. But you know, we still have a ways to go because in 2009, this is actually what the US population looked, at, looked like. So we've got to improve Hispanic, Black enrollment, and other enrollment in graduate. But we're improving, it's trending up. The other thing that it's improving is gender parity in scientific authorship. So this shows two different periods of time, 1996-2000 and in 2011-2015. And they looked at all the papers that were published in those years and determined how many of the authors were men and how many authors were women. And this just shows percent of men and women. So you can see in 2011 to 2015, we are getting increased women authors, but it's not 50%. So we really have some ways to go there too. Uh, I want to bring up the drug trials example that I talked to you about, because that's a really troubling one for us. Because we all take drugs, and we want to know that the drugs we're taking are going to work on us and those who are close to us. So this has been in the news. You might have seen some New York Times headlines in the last couple of years. But Congress has actually directed the Federal Drug Administration to increase diversity in trials and make diversity information public. So there's a ways to go, but Congress is telling us you need to work on this, you need to make this information known. Um, so there's actually this tool you can look up online called Drug Trial Snapshots. And for every new drug, so unfortunately it doesn't include the old ones, but newly approved drugs have to go on this website. And you'll see some information that this is just a screenshot. So this is from, uh, this is an asthma medication. So you can see it lists what are the possible side effects, but it also has a question is, are there differences among sex, race, and age? And you can also see the breakdown of who is in the study. So this actually had a lot of women, which is encouraging, but this had actually a lot of white participants. So, you know, it's a good tool for you as a patient and your doctors to figure out if the medication has been really tested in people like you. Um, and I just want to end with saying that government um, support for STEM education was really great during the last administration. So we really made a lot of headway. Um, lots of new pictures of Obama hanging out with children. One of his many initiatives was the White House Science Fair, where he invited groups of children to present their science to him because he just loves science. So you can see he made an effort to include diverse groups of students um, in his science fair. And at the government level, he did a lot of cool stuff with increasing public-private partnerships to increase diversity in STEM. So they did stuff like help, help make a movie made that included Hispanic researchers. So lots of stuff you wouldn't think of the government getting involved in to increase visibility. Um, the Education Department also expanded STEM access um, in funding. So now uh, the Ed Department wants, starting in kindergarten, kids taught about science and kids taught about diversity in science. Um, and Obama also expanded funding for early career investigators. So getting rid of little of those hurdles that I talked about in funding management. So in conclusion, we hope we've covered a few things. We hope we've convinced you that diversity is really a good thing. And when we work in diverse groups, we think harder and solve problems better. The diverse scientists and thinking of, and having scientists think actively about diversity is good for everyone. The lack of diversity among scientists can be really harmful and really slow the progress that science is making. That ideas about diversity in science are ingrained, but they are changing. And then hopefully we think things are getting better and diversity is gonna be something that we can overcome in the future. So, any questions? Yes. Yeah. So, thank you all, by the way, for your talks. Um, so, one question I had was with regards to like that more like getting better portion. Um, so I noticed that a lot of the metrics are like um, using like admissions and like uh, um, increased recruitment as a sign of like getting better, but um, usually like studies that show how like students from marginalized groups, marginalized groups do in those programs, there are high dropout rates a lot of the time because the environment is not conducive to like a diverse population. So I was wondering if like in any of your research, um, you have found like studies about how sensitivity training towards people in the overrepresented group affected 
um, how um, students of marginalized groups did. In the yeah. Programs. So the question was about um, we saw a lot of data that showed that we're increasing the students in graduate education, but the question is. Should there be efforts at supporting those students once they're actually in graduate education? What does the research say? Um, I did not, I totally agree with you, and I think that that, like, we really, really need that because this is really a poor metric because we've got so much happening before they get to grad school and so much happening once they get into grad school. So I totally agree with you. Um, I can't think of any research I've come across that looks specifically at that. Do you have any? So I, I've done some uh, research on the efficacy of bridge programs for incoming students for underrepresented minorities at both undergraduate and graduate levels. So the problem is these trial programs at the graduate level just have so few students that you can't, you, you can get anecdotal data, but you can't really get statistics. Um, at the undergraduate level, the highest quality statistical analyses and the pseudo randomized uh, designs have shown that you can't really show that there's an improvement from a one week or a two week um, sort of supplementary program, you know, that sort of tries to provide some just incoming students with extra support and, and connections and, and uh, um, sort of to meet faculty uh, for the first week or two of, of their undergraduate or graduate um, program. However, and this is just my opinion, but I, I think there's reason to assume that the reason we don't see efficacy in these programs is just that these programs don't go far enough. Um, so I, I completely agree that more research is needed. But you know, for example, if you go to the Department of Education, I think it's called the something clearing house, the best practices clearing house, which is sort of where they summarize the peer-reviewed literature on educational interventions. Um, for this kind of thing, there really are very few things where there's good uh, evidence that things work, um, but partly it's just because there haven't we haven't tried enough. Yeah, and I know in terms of educating like those in the minority um, or those in the majority, I've seen some research that on, on various different topics that it only works if you're sitting them down in a room, but it does work if you sit them down in a room, and that is not something that Harvard offers right now. So. I wish they did. Questions? Questions? Is the data on uh, diversity in religion or other type of diversity in science? Because you showed a lot about race and yeah. sex and gender, but not about the other type of diversity. So the question was whether we have any data on diversity in religion. Any of you, I did not come across anything. It seems like it might be hard to collect. I think that would be very interesting. I think potentially looking at ethnic and national diversity might cover some of that, but I think they, like when you're submitting a proposal to the United States, no one ever asks you for your religion. Um, it might be interesting to look into, but I think it's not something that easily we have the data to understand. I will say though that I showed three anecdotes about prejudice and science on kind of the race and gender axes of diversity because that's what we traditionally think about when we just think about diversity. But I did a lot of research and I could also show similar graphs about like socioeconomic and um, sexual orientation and all these other axes. I didn't come across religion. I think it's difficult to collect, but there are plenty of data out there for um, many of these ways that we can think about diversity. Is there any uh, scientific research that incorporates like historical facts? Like, I'd be curious to see how, like, five hundred years of Eurocentric colonization affects the <laughs> physical and you know mental health of a uh, person of color, including like, Black, Hispanic, Asian, you know, American, you know, state today. Can yeah. you come across anything like that? So the question was whether how we integrate um, the fact that there was five hundred years of colonization and how that's affecting science today. Um, your question was about people going into science or if there's any research today that, that incorporates historical facts. Yeah. Like um, intersect at all. Yeah, so I, I think there is a, there's sort of a emerging field the last few years is sort of sort of science technology society studies, mm -hmm. which sort of draws upon uh, philosophy and history to Tell us sort of what is science's place in society. 
Um, there are definitely some, there's excellent work <coughs> in that field uh, that treats some of those issues. Uh, one of the downsides is that philosophy is also very complex, perhaps even more so than science. I think on that. Um, so yeah, there, 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 there are problems with that. There's also a great community on Twitter uh, if that's something that you're interested in of sort of um, scientists who care about uh, philosophy and history and talk about um, diversity issues sort of in that lens. I definitely say that it is a bad, sad story for us as a society and there's been a lot of bad things that have happened. Um, and definitely not something that I think we have like great answers on, but a horrible thing, and we need to think about it as a society. Okay, well, thank you for coming. Um, we'd like to acknowledge the support of various things. Um, we'll be here for a few more minutes if you have other questions you want to ask us. So, we actually, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So if you're interested in talking about the draw scientist test that you did, we have checklists that you can grade yourself on and we can debrief and talk about some of the results if you're interested. If not, totally optional. Have a wonderful night.